Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Today we're going to discuss the exact point reactor kinetics equations, which we will use to model the behavior of reactors throughout kinetics transients. As you will see soon, these equations are called the point reactor equations because they integrate out all spatial dependence in the reactor and instead model it as one single point. To begin our long derivation of the point reactor equations, we start with the time-dependent Boltzmann transport equation, where the change in the number of neutrons in the system is equal to the source of prompt neutrons, F sub p, minus the neutron loss term, m, plus the source of delayed neutrons, S sub d. Note that the prompt neutron source equals the overall fission source minus the amount of fission events that release delayed neutrons. We could add lambda here to account for the system's eigenvalue, but for now, and throughout most of this course, we'll assume that we start with a system that is initially critical. Note that for a steady state critical system, that the source of delayed neutrons is exactly equal to the number of fission events that result in delayed neutrons. This is, for example, not true if a reactor's power increases quickly, since there is some lag time between when fissions create delayed neutron precursors and when these precursors decay and release delayed neutrons. Let's elaborate on this point and define some balance equations for our delayed neutron precursors. We'll first define C sub i of R and T, which describes the concentration, in terms of precursors per cubic centimeter, of precursors in the delayed group i at some position r and time t. Recall again that we group delayed neutron precursors into several representative groups since modeling each delayed neutron precursor individually is overly complicated and actually also prevented by limitations in nuclear data. From here, the rate of change in our precursor concentrations is equal to the negative lambda sub i times c sub i, where lambda i is the decay constant for the ith precursor group. In addition, we have an f sub d and i operating on phi term, where this term is actually equal to the rate at which fission events generate delayed neutron precursors in group i. Note that because lambda i times c sub i is the rate at which this group's precursors emit delayed neutrons, that this term here also equals s sub d for the ith group. From here, we will multiply both equations by the adjoint flux for the initial unperturbed system and then take the inner product of both equations. This changes our time-dependent Boltzmann equation to this equation. Now, note that the adjoint flux here is only the adjoint for the initial unperturbed system, and that the forward flux, the Boltzmann transport equation operators, and several other terms are actually time-dependent in these equations. Now, unfortunately, the flux's time dependence complicates these equations. We're not trying to solve for how the flux shape changes over time in response to a perturbation. That kind of four-dimensional problem, or possibly a seven-dimensional problem if you account for the energy and direction variables, is incredibly difficult to solve and is well beyond the scope of this course. There are plenty of applications where accounting for the time-dependent evolution of the neutron flux is absolutely necessary. In boiling water reactors, for example, even stable transients that do not lead to an indefinite power increase can cause huge spikes in the power and huge power oscillations because coolant might boil away in one region, which causes a decrease in power in that region, and then the coolant re-solidifies in response to the power dropping in that region, which causes a huge reactivity insertion in that region and thus a power increase. And overall, you get this kind of oscillating behavior as coolant boils away and then condenses in these different regions. However, in this course, we will ultimately be treating reactors as if they are a single, spatially independent point, and instead just track how the reactor's power evolves over time. To work towards this goal, we'll perform a separation of variables on the neutron flux. We'll assume that our flux is equal to a magnitude function, which is actually just the power of the reactor, p, multiplied by a shape function, psi. Now, psi is also a function of time merely because the reactor's flux shape can change over time. However, if the flux increases or decreases in any region, that overall flux should be reflected and mirrored by a corresponding decrease in a different region, so that if the overall power of the system changes and the number of neutrons in the system changes, 
it's reflected in the power term, not in psi. After assuming the separation of variables, we can bring the power term outside of our inner product terms, since power is not a function of space, energy, or direction. This will be helpful in a second here. Now, we will apply the separation of variables to the inner product that contains the derivative of the time-dependent flux. The product rules gives us one term with the power derivative over time, and another term with the derivative of the inner product of phi star naught operating on 1 over v operating on psi. Note that the velocity and phi star naught terms are actually time independent. Now we will deal with this rightmost term here by introducing a boundary condition, which is that this 1 over v psi inner product term must remain constant. The goal of this boundary condition is to ensure that any increases in the reactor's power are in fact reflected in the power term and not in any other terms. So what does this boundary condition imply, and why should it be true? First, it implies that the overall magnitude of the neutron shape function psi doesn't change. This makes sense, since any scaling or any across-the-board increases in the flux shape should be reflected in the power term. The second possibility is that the flux shape could change if neutrons move from regions of lower importance towards regions of higher importance. So they get multiplied by a higher adjoint, which increases the size of this term. But still, moving neutrons from less important regions to more important regions should cause a reactor's power to increase. And although this change will affect the shape of psi, after we renormalize the flux, it shouldn't cause this overall 1 over v psi term to increase. This means that the derivative of the rightmost term in the above equation is equal to zero, and that the time derivative of the flux term is simply reflected in a time derivative of the overall system power. From here, we re-examine our adjoint weighted equations, now with the power term separated out of the inner products. Next, we will begin a long journey that starts with dividing equation one by f of t, and equation two by f of t naught. These two f functions are just the perturbed and the unperturbed adjoint weighted fission sources. After doing this, equation one turns into this expression. And we'll now take a detour to define all the terms in these adjoint weighted inner product ratios, which are also known as bilinear ratios. We'll start by revisiting our old friend the perturbation equation. Now starting with this expression, if we replace f and m perturbed in this equation with f naught plus delta f and m naught plus delta m, we can expand this inner product into the combination of an unperturbed and delta inner product term. We can apply the property of adjoints to show that this first term is equal to zero because these inner terms become the adjoint Boltzmann transport equation. After separating out and canceling the power term from this ratio, this allows us to recast the perturbation equation to a form that equals the same bilinear ratio in our previous expression. Next, we'll revisit our mean neutron generation time, capital lambda. Before, I mentioned that our previous definition for lambda was approximate, and that the true definition requires adding a phi star term to both the numerator and the denominator terms, and then taking the inner product. In essence, this says that the mean neutron generation time depends both on the size of the population of the neutrons in the system and on the importance of where those neutrons are. Likewise, the denominator depends on the importance of the fission neutrons that are generated. For example, if fission neutrons are generated in a low importance area, they are unlikely to contribute to the fission chain reaction, which means that neutrons from other regions must diffuse throughout the system and make up for these low importance neutrons. Relying on neutrons from other regions increases the neutron generation time since it takes time for these higher important neutrons to migrate through the system. Going back to our previous expression, you see that this term here is now equal to lambda t. Similarly, our delayed neutron fraction beta for the delayed group i was equal to the fraction of fission neutrons born into delayed group i. Now we will define beta effective which builds on our definition of beta by incorporating the adjoint flux. Again, we see here that this term is just equal to beta effective. Now, previously I mentioned that beta is around 0.0065 for a light water reactor, 
and that beta effective is usually around 0 0.0055 for light water reactors. And of course the difference between these two values is because one of these quantities incorporates the adjoint flux. And actually because delayed neutrons, which are emitted in the several hundred keV range, are actually slightly less important than prompt energy fission neutrons, which are emitted in the MeV range. This might seem counterintuitive, and you might think that delayed neutrons would be more important, since they're less likely to leak and because they're closer to thermal energies, but in truth there are competing factors here. The majority of slowing down absorption takes place in the resolved resonance region, and up to somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of all resonance absorption can occur because of one resonance alone, which is the uranium-238 6.67 eV resonance. The lower birth energy of delayed neutrons doesn't really increase their resonance escape probability too much, since they must still survive the deadly 1 to 100 eV resonance absorption range. In contrast, very fast neutrons have some fantastic neutronic properties. The new bar value and the capture to fission ratio both increase significantly in the MeV range, and the uranium-238 fission cross-section increases dramatically by about four to five orders of magnitude in the MeV range. Delayed neutrons don't see these neutronic benefits from the MeV range because they're born in the hundreds of keV range, and they also suffer the same penalty of fast neutrons by having to survive the thermalization process. So these advantages of the MeV range tend to outweigh the slightly lower leakage probability of delayed neutrons. Last term we'll define is the zeta symbol, which I prefer to call squiggle. This term is equal to the adjoint weighted precursor concentration divided by f of t naught. Now this term doesn't have much of a physical meaning, but I suppose that when you multiply it by a lambda for whichever delayed group you're looking at, that it represents the fractional importance of neutrons in the system relative to the initial unperturbed adjoint weighted fission source that are emitted from delayed neutron precursors. This term is one of those mathematical concepts that are difficult to assign an intuitive meaning, so perhaps it's best to not worry too much and to instead focus on how squiggle is used in the kinetics equations. So after defining these kinetics parameters, we see that equation one contains the effective prompt neutron generation time, the reactivity, the effective delayed neutron fraction, and the precursor source term. We can substitute in these kinetics parameters and divide by lambda t to arrive at dp dt is equal to rho minus beta effective, both divided by lambda t times the power plus one over lambda t times the precursor term. Now let's deal with this precursor term. And we'll start by doing a little more math on the lambda t term. Because our boundary condition requires that the inner product of phi star naught 1 over v psi remains constant, we can actually replace the flux shape inner product term with the inner product for the initial flux shape psi naught. From here, we multiply and divide by the unperturbed fission source inner product, which reduces to show that lambda t is equal to lambda naught times f of t naught over f of t. Similarly, if we remember the definition for squiggle, we can recast the precursor term as a sum over each precursor group of lambda i times squiggle i times f of t naught over f of t times one over lambda naught times f of t divided by f of t naught. By bringing in our previous simplification for lambda, we can show that all of the f terms cancel and that the precursor term is just equal to one over lambda naught times the sum over each precursor group of lambda i squiggle i. Thus, after we bring all these simplifications together, we arrive at the first equation in our exact point reactor kinetics equations. Lastly, we will take our number two adjoint weighted delayed neutron precursor balance equation and divide it by the inner product of phi star naught f naught psi naught. From here, and with a little finagling for the beta effective term, we can see that the time derivative of squiggle i is equal to negative lambda squiggle i plus f of t divided by f of t naught times beta effective times the power. Together with our final form of equation one, we have arrived at the exact point reactor kinetics equations.
These equations are called the exact point reactor kinetics equations because they really rely on no major assumptions. Yes, we assume that the flux can be separated into the power and psi functions, and we introduce a very reasonable boundary condition regarding the adjoint weighted neutron density shape function, but we haven't homogenized any variables or really assumed anything about our perturbed system. Yes, the system contains only one row and only one beta effective term that represent the average row and beta effective for the entire reactor, but these singular quantities do take into account any variation in the local versions of rho and beta effective, so they should accurately represent what's happening in the entire system. However, this form of the point reactor kinetics equations is not especially useful in the real applications, or even in the simplified applications that we will solve in this course. Solving for the perturbed fission source, the exact reactivity, and the time-dependent beta effective and lambda terms is really more work than we want to do. So in the next lecture, we will review the assumptions and approximations that we typically introduce to make these exact point kinetics equations more useful.